APUS History with Wolfram. Welcome. This is your English colonization lecture. Please make sure you fill in your guided notes as we go along with this and feel free to pause it anytime so that you can review. So starting at the beginning, we're going to go into um, this English colonization lecture with talking about uh, why it is that England was on the eve of their empire. They had recently defeated the Spanish Armada and were trying to recover from their economic depression. They had a mobile, growing population, and as we talked about earlier, they were motivated by both God, gold, and glory as well. They attempted early in the 1590s to establish a colony at Roanoke, but that colony disappeared, and to this day we don't know what happened to those colonists. So we can divide the colonies into three sections, four sections, and we're going to start with our southern colonies. Sometimes we talk about the Chesapeake region as being that fourth region, and it's kind of within the southern colonies. Um, it combines some of the features of the middle and southern colonies. Uh, it had slavery, it had tobacco as a big cash crop, and they also farmed grain and had a more diversified economy than the more southern rural um, colonies. It also included Virginia, the states of Virginia and Maryland. So the Chesapeake region uh, was founded by, by a royal charter. The first established English colony appeared in Jamestown in 1607 by the Virginia Company of London, which was a group of investors. Their motivation, since they were a group of investors, was their desire for wealth, and their primary products were tobacco and grain. So you also need to know the significance of all of these colonies. It was the first permanent English settlement, source of fertile land and wealth to England in the form of cash crop of tobacco, their primary export. And the House of Burgesses is um, also one of the first institutions of representative self-government that was established in these British colonies. I do want to note that you will see over here things are bolded. These are key terms that you need to stay aware of and look for on your review sheets and study guides. So the other state oops, colony in the Chesapeake region was Maryland. It was founded in 1634 by Lord Baltimore, um, who was an important supporter of Charles I. The motivation here was a desire for profit, but also a desire for a refuge of Roman Catholics. This is during the um, situation and reformation in Europe, and so you have conflict in Europe between you have conflict in Europe between Protestants and Catholics. And so this was a desire to create a refuge in the New World for Roman Catholics. Again, their primary exports were tobacco and grain. They were a proprietary colony, which meant that they had to have a proprietor or sort of like a CEO who was the executive authority of that colony and owned all the land. Um, the head right system was popular in this place. This was the granting of land to encourage colonists to come over and also granting of land to your heirs. Um, and the major source of labor at this point was indentured servitude because people could bring indentured servants over and get land grants for their servants as well. And this was a way that a lot of people got to the colonies um, and sort of worked off the expense of them getting here. It was the first major Catholic enclave in the New World, and in 1649 they passed the Act of Toleration, which granted uh, religious tolerance to all Christians. The Deep South uh, was slightly different than the Chesapeake region. This was much more rural. They had a slower growth rate of cities. Uh, slavery played a much more major role in the plantations. Uh, the majority of farmers in the South were subsistence farmers without slaves. So there the majority of the farmers in the South were subsistence farmers without slaves. This created a defined social hierarchy. Here you see on the pyramid white landowners and plantation owners at the top. You had small subsistence farmers who were the largest population in the South. And then you had landless whites and um, indentured servants, former indentured servants, and the blacks who were slaves in this region. North Carolina was founded in uh, 1653 by Virginians. Their motivation was to expand into new territory, new land for these plantations. They were issued a royal charter in 1663 to eight nobles, and then they were took over by the crown 
um, and turned into North and South Carolina in 1729. Their primary products were tobacco and rice, and they were one of the most democratic and independent-minded colonies in the New World. They led to, they had some internal uh, strife, and so they split into North and South Carolina. They were the last state to ratify the U.S. Constitution. South Carolina, founded in 1663 under the same conditions as North Carolina. Um, because of those squabbles, they were split into North and South Carolina. Pr primary products were tobacco and rice, and they were one of the wealthiest colonies in the New World. They had close ties to the sugar plantations in Barbados, and in fact, many of their settlers were from Barbados. Georgia acted as a buffer between Florida and the South of the colonies, and this was, Florida was a Spanish colony at the time. Founded by James Oglethorpe in 1732, it received its charter then. Uh, it was located between South Carolina and Florida, which you can see up on the map up in the corner here. And when the debtors could start, um, this was a place where debtors could start fresh uh, and have a new life. It, it was a vital link to imperial defense, and Georgia began to have the intention with little land holding and no slavery, but then became one of the biggest slave holding states in existence. The middle colonies, these were in the middle of the New World, and they were more fertile. Their primary export was um, the export of grain, so they were known as the bread colonies. Their population tended to be more heterogeneous, meaning mixed. They had lots of rivers, seaports, and forests. There were fewer industries than in the north, um, and their government was somewhere between the northern personalized town meetings, um, where everybody knew each other, and the southern diffused county governments. So Delaware, this is an interesting story. Delaware, New Jersey, and um, New York all sort of have the same founding story. They were granted to James, who was the Duke of York from Charles II, and they were brothers. So Peter Menuet, who was the new Sweden company and the Duke of York, founded Delaware, um, and the Dutch actually formed the New Netherlands, but then when Charles II came to the throne, he granted his brother James the title of Duke of York, and James demanded um, that he receive the New Netherlands, and then he renamed it Delaware. It was part of Pennsylvania until um, 1703, and actually was governed by Pennsylvania until the Revolutionary War. New Jersey, Lord Berkeley and Sir George Carteret, uh, were good friends of that Duke of York, and they advertised and promised settlers benefits for colonizing, which included representation in government and freedom of religion. So the Duke of York gave his friends basically New Jersey. Um, it was the third state to ratify the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. New York was formerly known as the New Netherlands, has the same sort of founding story with the Duke of York, uh, their primary product was grain. It was originally founded by the Dutch East India Company. Um, the Dutch actually purchased the island of Manhattan for a mere uh, trinkets from the Native Americans in that region. One of the other items of significance is the Albany Congress, which occurred in Albany, New York in 1754 to help unite the colonies for defense against the Iroquois Confederacy. And later you'll see when we get closer to the revolution, Albany plays a big role and so does New York in that revolution. Pennsylvania was established by William Penn, who was a Quaker and was desiring religious tolerance. Um, in 1682, it was founded by William Penn. He was uh, granted a large land grant that had been left to his father who had passed away. His goal was to create a colony that allowed for freedom of religion, and he also wanted to experiment with liberal ideas of government like self-representation and those sorts of things. Uh, it was one of the biggest and richest colonies in the New World, and he did allow freedom of worship for all citizens within Pennsylvania. New England colonies, these are the northern colonies. Society centered there on trade, primarily because of all of those seaports that you can see up here on the map, just all of these seaports 
played a huge role. The population farmed, but that was subsistence farming. The soil and the climate were really poor for farming. So fishing and whaling were big in these regions. And then later, as manufacturing takes over, those ports were used to ship goods all over the world. Four colonies formed the New England Confederacy, um, and their primary purpose was defense against foes, primarily Native Americans. And they also subscribed to rigid Puritanism. So the Massachusetts Bay Colony, most of us are familiar with the story of the Pilgrims and the Mayflower, and here you go. It was founded in 1620 by separatists. The Puritans received a charter from the Virginia Company, but they were blown off course and landed too far north. And so when they were on the boat, they came up with the Mayflower Compact, which was an agreement to um, have a government ruled by majority rule and also created a theocracy, a government ruled by the religious leaders. This was some of the first steps towards self-government, and it is a document that we look at when we talk about the founding of the country as being pretty pivotal. The religious experiment on the hill, this idea that the Puritans wanted to create a religious utopia was part of the reason they came over here. They had been forced out of England during the, the troublesome, turbulent Reformation, and they went to Holland first and decided they'd come to America and try and create this utopia. Connecticut. Um, Hooker's emigration from Connecticut and the burning of the Pequot Fort. You have some pictures there. Those are some big uh, events that occurred in Connecticut's history. So Connecticut was founded in 1635 to 1636 by colonists moving into and starting towns. They sort of were just migrating from Massachusetts. Thomas Hooker led a group of Massachusetts colonists into that Connecticut territory. The motivation was that they were looking for more freedom from these very strict Puritan ideals and more financial opportunities. Uh, they were attacked by Indians, and so then they engaged in the Pequot War, and they basically decimated the Native Americans in the region. They're also significant for the Fundamental Orders of Connecticut, which were created in 1639 to establish a democratically controlled government by the substantial citizens. And usually substantial citizens meant that they were land-owning or land-holding citizens. These are some of the democratic ideas that appear in the Constitution. Rhode Island and Hutchinson and Roger Williams were banished from the Massachusetts colony for a belief in a separation of church and state. And um, both moved to form settlements, as did others, and these settlements later became Rhode Island. And they founded this colony on the basis of separation of church and state. It was the last colony to ratify the Constitution. New Hampshire, founded by John Mason. His motivation was a planned colony um, and creating money. Uh, it was part of Massachusetts until 1679. It was the ninth state to ratify the Constitution, which assured the ratification process. So how were colonial governors chosen? This is different depending on where you were. You had royal colonies, which were under direct control of the king. You had proprietary colonies, which were more like a CEO, colonies given to private property owners. Um, and then you had self-governing colonies, where the colonies ruled themselves. And you can see examples of those on this chart. The legislatures were different in all of those. Legislatures are law-making bodies. So in the royal colonies, the legislatures um, got their power from the king, and uh, you can see and track the pattern there from the king down to the voters. In a proprietary colony, the proprietor chose the upper house, and the voters chose a lower house assembly, and then you had self-governing colonies where the voters chose both. So that is the basis of the English colonization and really sets us up making sure that we know the differences between all of the regions socially, economically, and politically. Uh, these are definitely possible DBQs or free response questions.